introduce um, our Madoff faculty fellow and welcome everybody today, Croiso. It's nice to see everybody. Um, one of the things, I'm Jamie Gender, I'm the director of the Welsh Studies program here. And I, I recognize some faces, but some of you students are new, so it's great to see you here. This is a program of the Welsh, pro this faculty fellow um, program is a program that we have to bring faculty into research. And we have had 17, Dr. Evans is a 17th fellow, and what you see scattered around on the tables are some flyers of some of the previous presentations that I really, I, was, I got so nostalgic looking back when I was doing the program and, and compiling the list that started with Dr. Beth Brown in 2003. And <laughs> I know she was the very first <laughs> of the fellows. Um, and I'd like to give recognition to all of the former fellows because we've had some great projects. Check out the posters on the wall if you have a chance. I know they're hard to read now that we've got the lights turned down, but it has the, the titles of the projects that have been done. So um, I like to introduce the former fellows, and we started with Dr. Beth Brown. We've got Dr. Lawrence, Dave Lawrence was next, and I saw Professor Lyles come in, and we have Dr. Kent Williams didn't make it. He was thinking he would. Um, Dr. Evans also did a presentation in 2013. And she has been, and now she's reapplied. So she, this is her second time around. Dr. Sigismundi was in 2016. And then Professor Lyles and Benji Davies again paired up in 2017. And they did pair landscapes. And it was one of our most popular uh, presentations that actually traveled to Wales for um, display in a gallery. And we had Dr. Scott Beekman, who's in the back. And we have, right now, now we're Dr. Evans again. So I'll turn it over to her, and we do have refreshments afterwards. But, you know, before you start, let me take a chance just to tell you that um, we do have, we have selected our 2021-22 fellow, and she just came in. Dr. Box, Dr. Tracy Box is in the back. She is going to be studying, she's going to Wales in just a couple of weeks, and she's going to be studying the opioid crisis in Swansea. So she'll give her presentation next year at some point. We're a little off schedule. I think you can tell if you look at the, at the dates. But. And we also like to announce any of the um, study abroad students that are going to be uh, going in the fall to Trinity St. David. I've got Bailey Petri. Did she make it? Oh, yeah. there she is. Bailey has jumped through every hoop to get uh, ready to go to Wales, so we're excited about that. And then Drake Davis and Mason Gray Long are also on the list, but they weren't able to make it. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Evans. From Hunter, Dan Evans Dewey. Good afternoon. I'm Dana Evans, actually Dr. Evans, and I had a very modest research proposal, the history of Wales in medicine. Because, <laughs> you know, let's not think small. Actually, part of the reason why I picked such a broad topic was this: we actually have had smaller looks at that. But Dr. Sigismundi did look at the physicians of Mythi and the herbal medicine, and I will touch on that a little bit as well. But I am actually looking from ancient times up through to the modern era. And we're going to just start in the back. We're going to start in the Neolithic times and looking at the sacred waters, looking at the holy wells, and the importance of uh, water has waxed and waned in human consciousness. We have put emphasis on keeping clean water and then forgetting that it's important off and on literally through our entire history. Okay. Holy wells were most likely sacred to the Neolithic gods. We do know that up until the Iron Age, we definitely know that they were considered sacred. We knew they were holy sites. Um, that right there is St. Lithens. That is in the Vale of Morgan near Cardiff. And there wasn't really a well left because now this is pretty much in the middle of a cow pasture at this point. But uh, we know that they would set up around these waters. But it wasn't just drinking water to them. They were considered sacred. And they were considered the peak of medicine. This is what you did when you got ill. 
you went to wells to be healed. And I have a book up here. We actually had uh, the author, Phil Cope, he had been here. He had spoke to us several years back. Uh, looking at these, now actually this well, believe it or not, actually isn't in Wales. This one's actually in Ireland. I cheated a little bit. I know. I only got to one well when I was in Wales. And you will see that one later. But I didn't get to any one that would have been a little bit more natural. So I did pick the one that I did see in Ireland. But the Celts, all the Britons, as far as we can tell, really did believe that water was holy, that the sun set into the water at night, rose from the water in the day. Hello, Buster. <laughs> and this water was then imbued from the sunlight, from this goddess, with holy powers. And water drawn off at the winter solstice was the peak. So you probably would have seen a lot of holy men and holy women down at these wells at this time drawing the water off. Whether or not these wells would have been, you know, pieced away from the others, people, and only the priests would have been there, we really don't know. Because the Druids, the pre-Christian uh, pagan people, really didn't do a lot of uh, history taking. It's really, that came in with the Romans. But we do know, at least into the Roman time, when the Romans started taking some actual record keeping, we knew that these holy wells weren't just general cure-alls. They were very specific. You went to this well if you were blind. You went to that well if you were deaf, crippled, etc. Okay? Mental illness is when one where drunkenness was considered a problem. And rags were tied into the trees to indicate the requested favors. And you can see them here in the modern day still being tied to. And we still have people coming here in the modern era, modern day pagans, tying in their things. There are offerings that were flower covered. There are all sorts of offerings on the inside of the well. You can see at least the pennies that are offered in there. There were other things too. I didn't want to mess with them because you know people really do take that seriously. You don't want to be messing with somebody's beliefs. Again, the pagans really left no written in writing illustrating what they really thought of this. So we are doing guesswork. And we're doing guesswork based on the Romans, who were, let's be honest, biased. They weren't really the biggest fans of the local populace. So, you know, we, we do know they had some things. That's me tying a regular piece of grass as an offering into the tree. Okay. Moving along to a little bit of later contemporaries, let's look at the Romans. Romans were through Wales. If I ever go back, Roman Wales would be kind of interesting because let's see, let's, let's see what my people did to that people. Dang, gosh knows they were really interfering people. But they had a huge interest in water as medicine. They understood the importance of bathing, which did get lost a little bit there in the Middle Ages. Okay, but the Romans were really big on this. They understood the idea of clean water, clean body. And they had sewage, and that's what you're looking at there, guys. That is a Roman sewer. Okay. That was part of the latrine at Carillon. And it would pipe water literally away from all the buildings. And away from the waters where they were taking their baths, taking their drinking water. Okay. Now, whoever was downstream from this probably had a problem. Okay. But, you know, not so much the Roman settlement itself. The one well I did get to is probably the most spectacular of the remaining wells in Wales. And that would have been St. Winifred's. Okay. I do notice that I made a small change that didn't get saved. So yay PowerPoint, thanks. Okay. Uh, I just added her the Welsh name and that is Gwen, Gwen, yeah, Gwen Fred. And the longest, most successful run is a healing well. Now you can see part of the well there. This has been used since pre-Christian times, and it has had over 1,300 years of Christian usage. It is in use today. I have some of the water right here. Okay. I did collect that. When I was there, the Irish travelers were there, and they were making use of the well as a sacred site of healing while I was there. 
The oldest account of Winifred's life is the 12th century. Now, she was, that's about 300 years after her time. So pretty much a lot of this has to be taken with a grain of salt. But in a nutshell, uh, Winifred was considered the daughter of a chieftain. She was um, the niece to St. Bueno. We'll talk a little bit about him on the next slide. But uh, basically, Winifred had a suitor named Caradoc. And he did not like the idea that she wanted to be a nun. So, you know, in true, you know, in cell fashion, chopped her head off. Okay. And her, her head fell, the spring erupted. Okay, the spring erupted where her head fell. Now her uncle came along, slapped her head back on, and she came back to life. Kind of typical of a Catholic saint. Uh, I grew up Catholic, trust me, we have some wacky saints, okay? <laughs> and the head coming off and being put back on is a big one, and we see that a lot. Now, actually, the well itself, this is part of the, um, there's a chapel, too, okay? This is part of, actually part of the chapel that is there. So, the well itself, actually, this is not where the well originally was. The well got drained accidentally by mining and miraculously reappeared a few hundred yards away, which basically it just probably got diverted a few hundred yards and they found it again. But this thing survived the anti-Catholic laws, which were severe. They were punishable by death when we had the Protestant Revolution in all of Britain. And it actually survived as a shrine through the entire Reformation. It wasn't pulled apart. Now, you can see places where they tried, especially inside the chapel. You can see some of the things have been kind of hammered on a little bit. But it survived. Okay? And the whole idea of this, now, you don't pass through this. I'm just really looking at this bug that is flying around. I'm so easily distracted. You pass through the water three times. This is a pre-Christian idea. But it is still held to today. So the Irish travelers I mentioned, they're not in this well. You cannot go into this. But if you see kind of through the upper left corner, out here is like a swimming pool. And out there is where you can actually go in. And I didn't know you could actually walk in in a swimsuit. If I'd have known that, I'd have a swimsuit. Okay. Did not know that. And actually, St. Bueno's Rock is in there. And they would travel once around, kneel, say the Lord's Prayer at the, at the rock, around again three times. Okay. So they were in there doing this. I only went in as far as I could get without getting my shoulders wet. Okay. Basically, because I didn't want to get back in the car soaking wet. So I just kind of went around the steps three times. Kind of cheated. I'm sure God can forgive me. So, also, I didn't really want to get into the way of these Irish travelers. And if we're not familiar with them, they're sort of a the Romanesque type people. Um, so, still there, still by the water. They do tell you not to drink it. Because <laughs> gosh knows how much bacteria is in this water at this point, especially with people splashing around in it. But St. Plano's Rock is a rock that theoretically would swim downstream on his birthday every year and then float back to Winifred. Okay, so she would set this rock down to her uncle when it come back. When it didn't float away on his birthday, she knew he was dead. Okay, and the rock is still here. Honestly, the same rock, who knows? Probably the other biggest water, uh, basically water site remaining in Wales is probably Carrigio. And this is the Roman Baths. Caerleon was a fort in Caerleon, okay, on the River Usk. And again, this was not where that, that sewage thing that I showed you a little while is nowhere near this. Okay? Nowhere near this because, again, Romans didn't want to put sewage plus where we're going to get clean at the same time. So they build conduits for waters, underground passageways. You saw that part of the underground passageway. Air vents. They actually had stones that heated the walls through pipes. This is a hot spring. There's only really two that I know of in Wales. This one and Taffy Well, which I think is down south. And most of that has been kind of really a little bit disintegrated at this point. 
But the Romans knew the healing effects of the hydrothermal spas. We still use hydrothermal spas today all the time in physical therapy. Okay, if, we can, if, the, if the therapy can afford it, they have these. Okay, and even if they don't, most of our happy day spas have some kind of thermal water. Sewage control, super important. I didn't get a chance to explore this very much because by the time I got there, it was almost closing time. I had basically time for a picture. And then I went out and it was really cool because I got to see the Coliseum. And there is a Coliseum up there where they would have fought gladiators. Okay. A little bit off kilter for my speech, but it was a lot of fun to see. Okay. A lot of medicine would have been practiced there. Probably a lot of, you know, slapping some stuff on giant, you know, stab wounds, but there you have it. Right. Now, these Roman baths, these holy wells, this just did not disappear. It continued throughout the Middle Ages, throughout some of the Renaissance, all the way up into the 17 and 1800s, where we started having the craze called the taking of the waters. We have a huge amount of examples of that even here in the United States. Um, hot springs in Arkansas. We've got a lot of these around. I grew up near Franklin Springs in Pennsylvania, which was a sulfur bath. Okay, and that was huge business. And it was it's big business then. It's still kind of big business now. The Romans called this place Balanus Siluria, but it is actually now known as the Land of Dodd. Well, and Rock Park Spa. Um, I know we can't really read this too, too clearly. I'll get up to there in a second. Founded in 1750, so we're talking now almost a thousand years after Winifred. And by Dr. D.W. Linden, who claimed the waters cured him. And it's not just one spring at this particular site. At Rock Park Spa, we have saline springs, magnesium-rich springs, Calibate springs, calibate is iron. Radium, which we all know is radioactive, uh, probably not our bestest water, but at that, that time they did not know that. They did not know the effects of radium water till almost 200 years later, okay? Like in the 19, late 1920s, 1930s. And sulfur water. And this was really considered great medicine. I know you really can't read this very well, but this is actually the daily regiment for taking the water. She just didn't go there and, you know, splash around. This was considered real medicine. Hence the word, the cure. And you came in at breakfast and you drank the saline water for breakfast. The sulfur water was taken in the afternoon and the morning. The iron water was taken after every meal. Right? And so on and so forth. So there was this regimented way of taking these waters and <coughs> curing people. Because <coughs> Dr. Linden thought he was cured by these waters. Cured of what? The science didn't say. And I didn't see anything. It was surprisingly hard to find. Some stuff is very easy to find research on. Some stuff is not so easy. This, not so easy. Even though the entire town of Philanderda it grew up in the 1800s around these spots. And the town, I didn't include any of the pictures of the town, but the town was really picturesque. Obviously wealthy at one time. Very obviously. So this was huge. This is the present day Rock Park Pump House built in the 1800s, 1867. Okay, 100 years before me. And this was part of the Taking Waters Cures. Huh? I did get to go visit all through there. There was nothing super exciting inside there remaining. Actually, they were having like some kind of arts and crafts thing in there. So it's basically used as a community center right now. Um, the Kelly B.A. pump was given to the town in perpetuity. That's the iron pump. Okay. So they can still use this. And again, very regimented. This was medicine. That's the iron pump. You can see the iron as that orange stain everywhere. Unfortunately, no, you cannot drink from it anymore. That's what that little sign right next to it says. Don't drink this. Even though this has been put into perpetuity, it is, it's, it's filled with bacteria. You can't drink this water anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but this, what, what were they curing? The sulfur and saline? Eczema, which is a skin disease, other skin diseases. 
bronchial amen, so I guess, you know, upper respiratory infections, asthma, gastritis, and heartburn. I'm not sure drinking sulfur water is being my go-to. If you've ever smelled sulfur water, it smells like drinking rotten eggs. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, I say that because when I went to school in Florida, they pumped it straight from the local supply, which was lovely. It was a sulfur water, so all our water fountains smell like eggs. Gout, which is a joint infection, an infection, joint uh, inflammation, arthritis, diseases of the bladder and kidneys. So pretty much it was a cure-all. Okay. It really was considered a kind of a cure-all. Everything but mental illness is listed in there. Okay. Apparently, if you were insane, waters weren't going to help you. But this was given there, and it's still running. You can see the water is still pumping. It's just not safe for consumption anymore, unfortunately. They won't even let you go in and take a sample bottle of it. I mean, I guess if you asked permission, they probably would if you were doing a real big study. But that's a little bit more on the environmental side, and that's not my big thing. Magnesium waters, same. Oh, it's one of those stink bugs. Okay. And now it's on the ground. Good. Stay there. Tuberculosis was going to be cured by this. No, it wasn't. Okay? Because tuberculosis is an infection. You could drink all the magnesium water you want. You're still going to have TB. Okay. Now. The uh, Kelly Bot water was used for anemia. That actually would have worked. That's iron. It's iron water. You can see me there, and again, now you can see all the iron staining everywhere from that. Because okay. that's how much iron's in it. Okay. That reminds me of my place in Wisconsin. That's what my uh, bathroom looked like. It was you know, iron stains everywhere. So, and this was the guidebook. If you came to the Philander of Wells, in 1897, this is what would have been left in your room. So from two to six glasses should be taken before breakfast. It's a lot of water, dude, so. And perhaps another more in the forenoon, but not later in the day. So no water then. Each dose should follow active exercise. So again, they're putting together some things that are important. Exercise actually is sort of a medicine in its own way. Now, it's not going to cure everything, obviously. But being active does make us a little healthier. It is important for those who come to secure experienced advice. Listen to your doctor. Okay? And your doctor was sending you to these wells. And these were medicine. So the doctor would send you there. If you weren't going to do what you were supposed to, just stay at home. Oh my gosh, when I was seeing patients, I would have loved to have been able to say that. If you're not going to listen to me, why are you here? Okay? And my nurses have heard me say that before. We were just talking about non-compliance today in class. Because okay? a lot of patients are non-compliant. So if you're just going to come there, drink the water, and sit in bed, they're already warning you. It's not going to, it's not going to help you. Okay. So there's that. Now I'm going to backtrack in time. We're going to go back again. Because I wanted to kind of to keep the water theme all the way through. Do we still use water? Yes, we do. Do we need fresh water? Of course we do. Is it really medicine? I don't know. The people selling you uh, alkaline water, aren't they? Pretending it's medicine. Okay. Uh, whatever. Let's go back to the medieval times. Because, you know, medicine was fun back then. <laughs> Wild West, really. Right. So, we got basically a couple of places we're getting in. The church. I spend zero time talking about it. Why? Well, actually, I lied. I'm going to talk about it like briefly, like one statement after this one. But basically, it was if you're sick, God hates you. Pray. Okay. And if you don't get better, God really hates you because you didn't get better. That was pretty much it. That's what the pastor would have told me. Okay, straight up. Physicians and leeches. I will talk briefly on them. Not a whole lot. Why? A lot of that is known. And a lot of that isn't Welch culture specific. So it is in my paper whenever I actually finish it because there were their problems. Let's just leave it as COVID and then I spent last year in the hospital. Which is why two years later you're hearing my speech. Um... I will talk a little bit about that, but not a lot. Most of that would have been actually European. Uh, they would have been sent to Greece. They would have been sent to Rome. They would have trained even in Egypt. And they would have been trained in that style. And they did come back, but we'll talk just briefly about that. I will talk more about the monks. The barber surgeons, again, they would have had pretty much much the same training as the physicians. Just briefly mention them. And then I will talk about the cunning folk. And what is the difference between them, the cunning folk, and the magicians? Magicians, really? Physicians. 
putting monks in position together. Well, they actually were magicians, and we'll talk about that too. We'll actually talk about magic as medicine. Now, the actual physicians would have been fluent in Latin and Greek. These people would have been trained on the continent, or at the very least in London and Edinburgh in Scotland. Right? If they had not gone to the continent, they would have at least gone to London or Edinburgh. Right? They were exclusively used to treat the wealthy. The royals got them. Everybody else got the rest. Right? Barber surgeons, and yes, really were barbers, were actually surgeons. Yes, the whole red and white barber pole is the whole winding of bandages, bloody bandages out to dry, because you would wash and reuse bandages. I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But these people would have cut your hair, pulled your teeth, they would have lanced any wounds if you came in with an abscess, they would have lanced it for you. Uh, they would have done trepanning. Anyone know what trepanning is? Everyone's going to stare at me now. Yeah, yeah we're going to drill your head open. Okay. That sounds safe. We've, we know we've been doing that since the Neanderthals. Okay. We've been trepanning for many, many, many years. Now, was it always for medicine, or was it to let the gods in and out? Who knows? Performing amputation. They did a lot of that, and bloodletting. Now, I'm not going to talk tons and tons about bloodletting, but bloodletting was a big deal. Okay. I'll talk a little bit more about the cunning folk. Now, the cunning folk was more of a British term, kind of used more in England. In Wales, they would have been called the Din Hispis, which was used interchangeably with males and females, but Din really means man. And the Fenway Hispis, the wise women. And really, that was the realm of women. And there were a lot of female healers, up until a certain time period. But we'll talk about that. It is really hard to find a lot of this. I do have a book on it right here, actually, The History of Women in Medicine, which talks about the cunning women. And it's up here on our, my desk up here. I've got a bunch of stuff up here on the desk that you can all look at later if you'd like. The cunning women would have predated the monastic healers. These would have gone back to the pagan era. And they maintained. Okay? So they were older than the monastic healers. They were older than the barber surgeons. They were older than the leeches. And a leech was a doctor. Okay? We'll talk about why they would call that. We have dug up graves where these women would have found wearing both pagan symbols and Christian symbols. So they would have pagan rings. They would have Christian rings. They had a large bag with organic materials like the one I have up on my desk up here. And so they would have had herbs with them. They would have had some other organic materials that weren't herbs. Okay? They had a knife. You can just imagine what they were doing with that. Okay? And a leather bib. They were just handing out medicine. They wouldn't need a leather bib. They were cutting. Okay? These, women were, these women and men they were cutting men as well. They uh, were cutting people. They were surgeons. To, a, to an extent, not the way we think of surgery. They would have been lancing things. They may have been doing amputations. Okay. So we do know that they were doing this. The cunning women did heal the sick. But they also spoke to the spirits. So if you wanted to talk to the, your dead, there you go. If you want to talk to the gods, they'll do it for you. Only they could predict the future. Because wouldn't you like to go to your doctor and you know get your plus, you know, see who your future lover is going to be? That'd be great. It's like all one, you know, one stop shop. They were highly skilled surgeons. We do know that they did amputations. We know that they did lancing of wounds, pulling of teeth. And the remedies are preserved in the ninth century, so that's year 1000. No, 800, I lied. I can't do math apparently in my head at real quick times. Okay. 800. Vault, leech book, number three. And the Lugnuga manuscript, which is an Anglo Saxon. Recipe book. Then that just means recipe. Okay. So we have these women's and men's recipes. We know what they were doing. Because okay. by the 800s, we were taking records. And we were taking records a good 300 years before that with the, you know, the influx of the Romans. But we definitely have this. Um, you can actually see that. I didn't grab a picture of them. Um, but there, you can actually grab some pictures of these. They are online. You could probably search on them, you probably can find these online. However, the cunning women did suffer with the rise of Christianity. 
Um, the quote comes actually from my book on uh, women in, uh, medicine, Augustine, as in Saint Augustine. Augustine needed to demonstrate that although the results achieved by the cunning women were beneficial, they were nonetheless evil because women are capricious and anything we do sucks, basically. Like Saint Augustine. So basically, women suck, and anything they do sucks. That was basically the whole takeaway of St. Augustine. And that sealed women's fate for your centuries. Women were just completely discredited. Even though they were the primary healers for centuries, thanks to the rise of the Christian church, that went away. Now, if you were in Britain, or heaven help you if you were in Spain, they would have just basically burned you at the stake. Whales did not burn any witches that we know of. They actually really didn't do a lot of witch hunts. They basically just preached and made it so uncomfortable that they left or they quit. Take your pick. And they just kind of poisoned the water that way. And eventually, you know, if nobody in town will talk to you because you're now an evil witch, Either you're going to change your ways because you depend on everybody, especially back then, you depended on everybody for survival. And if no one will deal with you, you're not going to survive. So that's where they went. Now, medieval thought was only humors. We did, medieval medicine was not medicine as we understand it today, seriously. Men's body was composed of four humors blood, heat, and moisture. We had color, we had phlegm. And we had bile. They had absolutely no idea what they were talking about, really. They literally had no clue. And this, pers this persisted for years, mostly, again, because of the inhibitions the Catholic Church placed on any research. The Catholic Church was not science friendly in the Middle Ages or even in the Renaissance. So they didn't do a whole lot of research. They were literally using Galen's book. And Galen was back in the time of the gladiators. They used his book for about a thousand years, and he was wrong. And that's just it over here in Welsh. And yeah, good luck reading that, because you can't even read it on this side, but on this one over here. So, leeches! I brought you some. I brought you some leeches. Okay. I wanted some live ones, but I didn't get any in time. So, preserved leeches is what you're going to get. I'm actually in Chepstow Castle here, on the border of Wales and England. And I found this dude by accident. He just happened to be there talking about medieval medicine. I listened to him for an hour. I won't tell you everything, because I only have about an hour. Okay? And I'm already halfway through it. So, these leeches were used for bloodletting along with blades. And actually, that's what some of this is here. I don't think I put, these are flenses over here as well. And we would bleed you. And we didn't have to follow the calendar. No one bled in January. They were afraid of making you cold, really. But only from the thumb, left thumb, excuse me, wrong thumb, left thumb in February. How they came to this, who knows? I think that's really lost to time. This was considered absolute medicine. Is bloodletting medicine? Yes. If you have too many red blood cells, and there are certain conditions that cause that, They'll tap you. We'll, let, we'll, we'll actually do bloodletting. Now we don't just, you know, slap a leech on you. Or we don't sit there and just cut you and let you bleed into a cup anymore. But we will come in and tap you for blood. We'll take it off. So, it is medicine. But not the way they used it. They used it for everything. I think most of us are aware now that George Washington got killed that way. You know, they, they kind of overbled him. But, you know... It is what it is. Do we use leeches in medicine today? Yes, we do. And I have. We use it for like reattachment surgeries where we don't want it to swell too much. We'll just put little leeches on there and let them suck the blood out. Because they're now we're not growing up to the stream and catching a leech. We are going to grow these sterilely nowadays. Now they would have been out. In the, they would have been out where these came from. So we're just out in the water grabbing them. And this guy had a fantastic display. I mean, well, actually, part of it is on my uh, on the on the flyer for my speech. Um, I had a close up of this. 
Uh, and it's really, and this is all kind of neat stuff in here. The knife is good sharp medicine. Of course it is. Surgery. Okay. That's, we use the knife all the time. Probably use it a little more safely than they did then, because what didn't they have then? Oh, everything. The anesthesia, aseptic technique, and you know, pretty much they're just gonna give you some, they actually did have some anesthesia. And I did find a recipe, it is in my paper, it's not included in the talk. They did actually have, using like henbane and opium, uh, basically something to make you kind of go to sleep while they cut on you. So that's Chepstow Castle right there. I stayed right across from it in the Three Tons Inn, which has been there since the 1400s. I mean, how fun is it to stay in an inn? It used to be a funeral parlor. And I'm like, man, this is great. Did I sleep? No. Was I going around looking for ghosts? I'm like, yes. Okay. I'm like, I'm not sleeping. I'm moving. So what he's showing us over here is a pill. P-I-double-L-E. It's not entirely Welsh. Actually, we think the Germans probably came up with it. For the chemist in the group, that is antimony. Okay? It's a heavy metal. And this was used for digestive issues. So if you know, I had the stomach flu over the weekend, so let's say you needed to throw up because you're so sick. And so we all know this. If we throw up, we feel better, right? Sometimes. So this, they give you this. It's give you heavy metal poisoning, basically. Here's a pill, puke. You then fish the pill out of the puke, wipe it off, put it back into the case for the next time. You had a family pill. Some of these pills went down in families for three, four hundred years. Okay? You had this pill. No, it gets worse, guys. It gets worse. Okay? Let's say you had problems at the other end and you had constipation. Now, the pill didn't go that way. The pill went in. And then they actually. They said vinegar kept them from throwing it up. I would like to try that, but I can't, I can't see me going through the IRB going, I want to make students puke and see if vinegar stops it. I'm pretty sure I won't get through. Right. But they would put vinegar in there so you wouldn't puke. But it would go down the other way, and then, of course, the heavy metals would give you explosive diarrhea. Then you fished the pill back out of that, wiped it off, and ready for next time. Aren't you glad we don't do that with pills these days, right? <laughs> Medieval medicine. Medieval medicine is going to get crazier. That's not the craziest thing I'm going to tell you today, that you actually had to swallow a pill that came out of a pile of poop. Okay. Like this one. If worms are in your eyes, cut the inside of the eyelids. That sounds like fun. And then put in there celadine juice. The worms will die, your eyes will be healthy. You know, ignoring the fact that you just uh, cut holes in somebody's upper eyelid. Actually, celadine juice is still used today in Ayurvedic medicine in India. And it is used today as an immune booster and anti-anxiety tonic. I don't recommend it. We are starting to find out that celadine is hepatotoxic, which means it kills the liver. But then again, right before I came here, I took a Tylenol, which is also hepatotoxic. Okay? It's just on the dose of how often you take it. Um, I don't really suggest you squirting it in the eye, but they used it for centuries. And at least they put it in the eye. The eye worm, here's some eye medicine. You're going to see we're not always going to do that. Some of the cures use both magic, spoken magic and medicine. I will get into my picture there in a minute. They're actually treating the bleeding fig, which is hemorrhoids. Okay. <laughs> If you don't know what a hemorrhoid is, it's an enlarged blood vessel often hanging off the back end of you. You can't get them other places like inside of your esophagus. And repeating it, the it there, I just didn't want to, it's already getting wordy, is a prayer. They had prayers for this. So you had a prayer, you sat on a stone, you're supposed to sit on that stone so you saw the imprint of your hemorrhoid in that stone. So you're sitting naked. And it was repeated nine times, because nine is a multiple of three. We had what? We had the Trinarian goddesses prior to the Christian era, and then what? We still have the Trinity as far as Christians are concerned, you know, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost kind of thing. That really is partially an adaptation, or at least an exploitation of the pagan belief that made it a little easier for the pagans to convert. Right. So, well, if sitting on that magic stone didn't help you, 
That's a cartery iron. That is a hot poker. <laughs> Into the bone. I think I'm going to pick the hemorrhoid, okay? <laughs> my choices were going to be hemorrhoid or a hot iron in my butt. I think I know my choice. Okay? And he seems awfully happy about it. Okay? I mean, he, he seems awfully happy to have to be blinking into this cup that he's standing on. I'm like, why are we basically looking at it? It's like an altar cup. I'm not sure what we're doing here. Because he actually doesn't look like he's standing at the altar, doesn't he? That's a bizarre picture. Obviously, this is a picture from a medieval document. Um, I have no idea what this says. It's Latin. <laughs> but it probably says it kind of helped me. Okay. So, we also had something known as the King's Evil. Okay. And the King's Evil was a scrofulous disease, probably tuberculosis, and the swellings that people got from that. And the royal touch was used to cure this because royals were considered holy. Divine rule. This went from the Middle Ages in the 1130s, 1160s, I just looked, I looked, uh, not even, all the way into to George the First, literally almost to the point of the American Revolution. If you went and saw the king and they touched you, you were going to be healed. Sometimes they would touch, they have a festival, and they touched 30,000 people. Okay? And actually, the only reason it ended, not because that we suddenly stopped believing that the royals were holy and it was going to cure them, it's just that the royals didn't want to touch 30,000 sick people. Okay? They're like, ew, I don't want to touch them. Okay. So, what do we see here? Can you see the halo? Okay. I'm actually at this, I'm, I'm at this earth church, okay, which I forget where it's at. But this is a saint. This is the body of a saint, which was very, very common. Almost every Catholic church has a piece of a saint in it. Okay? It has to. can't be a Catholic church without a dead piece of body somewhere. Okay? Um, they thought these saints were so holy and so able to heal. You can't really see it in the picture very well. Unfortunately, I did not get a good picture of it. They actually would come in and chip a piece of that stone off and swallow it to heal themselves. Different kind of medicine. Again, that magical thinking kind of medicine. And this went on for centuries. I'm, I'm not really sure. I don't even remember what that saying is. Um, I didn't write it down for some time memory, and I wrote a lot of things down. I didn't write down that. This was the prayer from the Common Book of Prayer in 1594 from Hampton Court in England. Because okay. that's where all the kings were, right? I'm not going to read it all, but basically, we're just going to call on Jesus to heal you. If he doesn't heal you, I told you, Jesus don't like you. Okay? You don't get better, God hates you. That was it. There's no answers about the body. And they believed this. Seriously and truly believed that they were sinners and they hadn't been holy enough to have God's intervene with that. And I'll tell you what, you see people like that today. I will tell you, I have seen people like that. I've had patients like that who honestly believe that God is the reason they're ill or the reason they're getting better. Now, I want to talk quite a bit about something that really is probably one of Wales' biggest additions to medicine, and that is the physicians of Smith body. And that's one of the best, most comprehensive sources of traditional Celtic plant medicines recorded anywhere. Sometime before 1233, okay, the part that we have, that picture of it, is actually the Red Book of Pergast from 1382. Okay. We have this stuff written down. It contains hundreds of remedies featuring native plants along with older oral traditions known as Vose Magica. Like I said, holy, this magic, voice magic. And it was actually gendered. If you were female, you whispered it in this ear. If you were male, they whispered it in the other ear. Okay, So it actually mattered okay, which one you were. So they will whisper it in there. How many of them exist? Hundreds we know of. Later dates say 800. They're now thinking there was a, I don't really want to get into his name too much, but he wanted to really boost Welsh culture in the world. And he made a bunch of crap up, okay, including several hundred of these recipes. So trying to find, so that's why they're going back to the stuff that would be in the Red Book, stuff that was we know for a fact is original. 
Um, the legend here, we have Reese, a young man who agreed to marry this lovely lady who raised from the lake. That The lake's up there. The lake is here. I ain't down here. There's sheep between me and that. And I decided I didn't want to go up there. Okay. Actually, I was, rushed, I was rushed for time, so I didn't have time to walk all the way up there. It was hard enough to find this place. Okay. But uh, Tulin F. von Bach was up there. And this is the typical fairy wife. Very typical fairy wife story. She came, she married the human with the same. And you see this with all kinds of fairy tales. You got three times, you hit me three times without cause, I'm gone. And sure enough, he hits her three times, she disappears. She does come back to her eldest son, Rowan, and gives him all of these recipes for all this healing, all this fairy magic healing. Okay? And he told his future, and his descendants are going to be healers. Okay? So technically, all of this came from a woman. All of it came from, basically, a magic woman. Who she was, does this really exist? How did they really come by it? We are never going to know the answer to that. Okay. It is likely that the first of five Shishan, Rawalan, and his sons, Berugan, uh, Griffith, and Aeon, were court physicians. There's actually some argument, were they even actually European trained, traditionally trained? They did treat Lord Greece Greek and his people, who were part of the uh, Danubar the dynasty, buried at Stratoforda, there they are. And those are the kids, those are the princes right there. I did go to Stratoforda. Stratoforda just means layers of flowers. And okay? Florida does mean flower in Latin. So there they are, all the little princes that these guys were taking care of. Um, there's also so much we could talk about with this. Welsh law, the Bill Dunn, says that they actually knew what they would be paid for this. So if you had a scar on the face, a wound, they call them scars, because that's what they're going to heal with that. So if you had a scar across here, if I fixed it, I would get, um, you know, 30 pence. But if you had a scar down here under your clothing, three pence, you know, you're not even worth it. Who cares? No one's going to give you But I love the fact that they could take up the health whip, which is an indemnity to protect them from being held responsible. If you know that, probably one of the first written malpractice that's malpractice insurance. Okay, so it dates malpractice insurance dates back to at least the Middle Ages, which I think is great. And again, all of them ended the same way. It is proven. God is going to do this for you. And if you don't get better, you can't blame me. I have this. And God didn't like you. Okay. I did go to Mithvah. I was honestly a bit disappointed in Mithvah. And the reason I was disappointed in it was basically it's just a little welcome center with a little garden, and it does have the legend, and yeah, that's about it. And actually, the legend was in the cafeteria, not in the big meeting hall room, where you could have easily read it, because people were then sitting in front of things eating, and you couldn't read everything. And I'm like, this is a dumb way of doing this. But they do have their own publication, which I do have up here, which is kind of cool. So at this point, I was, should have had research. And I did have a student working on some of the herbal treatments that we were looking at. And then COVID happened. And that didn't happen. And then, like I said, last year, I spent, half, I spent the entire spring semester in the hospital. That didn't happen. So again, if you got any senior to be students in here who want to research some herbs, come talk to me. But Dr. Ruskis Monday did her research in this. And actually, that's a place that if we continue to do some of this, we could actually publish it. They do publish research pertaining to the recipes of the physician. So that was neat. And it was a kind of a nice little tourist thing, but it's like, okay. They were more interested that I went to the church to see where Prince Charles Worships when he's there because Prince Charles actually has a home here in the fight. Now, they didn't just do herbs, they gave charms out because demons and ghosts and evil spirits were all real to these people. And they were serious medicine. And there are still people. I have one. I didn't wear it today, but I have a little 
anti-evil thing that my grandmother had that was part of the Italian culture, and I wear it around a lot. Okay, do I actually believe someone's going to give me the evil eye? No. Okay, but they did, and this stuff dates back to that. And actually, there were 32 days of the years. If you were born on one of those 32 days, you're screwed. Okay, I'm not even going to waste time with you. You're going to die young. Okay. I didn't find what the 32 days were. I would have liked to have seen a list of that. I want to see what I want. Okay. Astrology played a huge role in this. And not just for the physicians of Methodi, not just for the cunning women, for all the doctors. They really did. Astrology played a role. You didn't do things on certain days. And the recipes did follow a pattern. Um, somewhere up there, right? I do have the Welsh kind of half buried over there. But I actually need to get that back to uh, six it's Monday, actually. That's hers. The rubric, the kind of medicine that we're going to use, the composition, the preparation, what useful it is, it, and then, well, proof of it. It's proof. It's going to work if God likes you. If God doesn't like you, you're dead. It doesn't matter. Okay. I did all I could. Okay. So the Medi the Medigon, myth by is literally the longest medical dynasty in Britain. It's probably one of the longest medical dynasties in the world. It went from at least the 1200s to 1739, where the last one died. That's his grave. That's actually at the church that Prince Charles worships at. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, there are still descendants practicing medicine today. Okay? They are, you know, they're not this kind of doctor anymore. They are, you know, traditional doctors. Now, we are doing research, like I said, I plan to do research, Dr. Sigurd's money has done research, she's presented it, that was one of the most presentations that we've had. Um, it's challenged by inconsistent terminology. This is why, for those of you who are biology students, why we harp on this all the time with the scientific, you know, terms. And mistranslations, and actually, none of the modern botany in that area matches anything that the medieval ones that were there. Is that because it was farmed? We have no idea. And here's something different grew back. Very possible. So we have no real way of knowing exactly what they were talking about in some cases. That doesn't mean people haven't studied it. I know Dr. Sigurd's money went, and I went to the Botanical Gardens of Wales. And they are still doing studies. And they did a fant they have a fantastic garden there. And that's part of it. And that's just one of the many, many pictures I took of it. I didn't go on and on with that again. We've had a whole talk on just this piece of medicine. I didn't have a few cures that I thought were kind of fun. Impregnated bandages known as liniments. Now I just had surgery on my hand just a few weeks ago, and I did have a liniment on it. Okay? I had a, a liniment imbued with triple antibiotic ointment and honey. Is that really all that different than what they did? Not really. Because honey was one of the things they put in the band-aids. Wormwood and mugwort, that's mugwort over there. Okay, there are Tunisia species and they're antimicrobial. And mugwort is considered basically a mother of herbs. And it was really thought to be very potent medicine. And it also kept away those evil spirits. And it was hung in many medieval Welsh homes. They would just basically hang a spray of it up over the window or the doors okay, to keep the evil spirits out. Um, for some cure, if you have a boil, which is a little abscess, usually on your bum, but other places, I have some red dead devil up here in the front, or purple dead devil, I'm not sure which one it is. All I know is it smells. That's why it's over there. Okay. Um, you just take some of that, take the root of that, take some mugwort root, take some heap speed, well, and boil them. And this is where we get into some issues. They want you to boil them in milk, water it, put some butter in, water it, drink it. Is that really going to cure a boil? <coughs> Probably. And my nursing students are like, nah. And then it's not because you got to get it into the boil. So they, they had some weird ways of doing it, but I mean, they were on the right track. They had antimicrobial things. They might have been better lancing it and then just pouring that milk with this stuff into the wound, sort of like a triple antibiotic ointment. They didn't do it that way. Um, if you got bit, take greater plantain, which we also know is an antimicrobial now. We do know that. Greater knackweed and common knackweed. Again, they were drinking them. Then we get into some weird ones. If you have a snake bite and you're a man, you take a live cockerel or rooster and put its butt on your bite until the rooster dies. <laughs> if you're a female, you use the hen. Now imagine wandering around with a chicken butt on your foot or whatever until the chicken died. And what was the chicken dying of? 
That was my question. <laughs> yeah, what did you say? Chicken just probably had a, you know, had a heart attack. It was really like, took it like, what are you doing to me? Okay. Tell me about this strangle that just to make it end. Is that really going to help a snake bite? I can guarantee you, nothing in a chicken's ass is going to cure a snake bite, okay? <laughs> no. Not happening. A cancerous tumor? Take some goat dung, grind it up, mix it with some egg, and uh, put it on there. Um, I guarantee you, when I was having students do recipes from the book, nothing was using put goat poop or baby urine. Baby urine was another big one. Okay? No, not so much. Also, I'm going to go out on a limb and say go poop is not going to cure your cancer. Okay? I'm going to go out there. I'm fairly certain of it. Okay. The eye has seven enemies crying, keeping vigil, sore eyes, drunkenness, fornication, cataracts, and smoke. I'm thinking if you're drunk and having sex, it's going to make you go blind and cover off the enemy. Okay? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I do remember some kids being told that, you know, masturbation make you go blind. Let's test that theory, okay? <laughs> so let's go away from the physicians, because again, we have had an entire talk on the physicians of the five, but I did have to go. I really did have to see them. You can't really talk about the history of medicine and wealth without talking about one of their biggest contributions. Monastic medicine, that's me at Strata, Florida. I, I'm standing there to give you some scale of how big and how very little was left thanks to the dissolution and the reformation. Illness was God's punishment. Prayer is the cure. But the monks did take that one step more. Some of the pastors didn't, but the monks and the nuns did. They did have medieval hospitals and hospices. And a hospice was really, I'll talk about what a hospice is on another slide. But the hospice isn't what we think of hospice. Hospice now is end of life care. That's not what that meant back then. They did provide living spaces for the blind, the infirm, the mentally ill, but people with leprosy. They actually had like places where these people could be basically dropped off and cared for because they were not going to be cared for by the general populace. It just wasn't going to happen. The month's care was often pretty poor, because most of these guys probably weren't trained by anyone. Okay? They certainly weren't trained in the Greco-Roman European style, for the most part. And they probably would have been basically self-taught with herbs. Um, in the monasteries of England, we have healing texts. We don't have any evidence that they did in Wales, but you, you would have to think. These are Sister Karen monks. They were a brotherhood, and they did travel in between each other. So they probably have them. But we have very little records left because of the dissolution. They destroyed everything. Because this was Catholic, and this had to die. That, by the way, is Tim Turnabby. Okay. This was lost. This was literally lost in the wilderness for centuries and got discovered again, I think in what, late, either the 1700s or 1800s. They did have a barber on their payroll. That means they had a barber surgeon. Okay. So we know that they had that. So we're going to suggest that this was set up pretty much exactly like the English one. So if they had healing text in England, Wales had to have had them too. Um, again, that's an that's a assumption on our part, but it seems like a fairly reasonable assumption. All of the Sister Karen monks had a separate farm infir yeah, try that again. infirmary that we're going to keep the infectious diseases isolated. You know, lockdown, the thing that we struggled with so hard, okay? The idea of walking them away. That wasn't really all that hard for the medieval people. You're lucky they didn't wall you in to your house, because they did do that with the plague. Literally just pound nails and boards over your house. Like they didn't set them on fire. Okay. I was to have an, insulate, in, uh, an isolation infirmary near the gate, and that's what the hospice was. The hospice was a hospital for the poor. Because the monks were supposedly dedicated to poor living. Supposedly. You can't tell me you built something that looked like that and you were poor. Okay? We know that as a true. They know they had money. Okay. Um, that's a well right here. 
Um, the sick monks of Tintern did have their own private fireplace, their own private room, and their own private retro choir for worship, because they had, still had a worship, even though they were sick, still had a worship. But they didn't want them in the general populace. Okay? Just keep the sickies over there, the rest of us. That up there was the choir for the non-sick monks. Uh, you can see where the, the tour would have been. Right, it's obviously gone. The monks, known as an infirmary, ran the infirmary, giving the patients a bowl and something to drink. And he would have done so quietly because most of these monks had vows of silence, or at least expected not to be chatterboxes. I would have failed miserably. And I am not quiet, and I never shut up. So I would have made a really sucky monk. And well, also I'm a female, so that would have made it even harder. But here's the infirmary. And you can see the separate rooms. These are all separate rooms that they would have been kept in. So they actually had their own little hospital rooms, which they would not have had that as they weren't sick. They probably would have been sleeping in barracks. So they did know to separate them out so we wouldn't spread this to everybody else. How good were they? Well, that's debated. Gerald of Wales hated them. Okay. And he was one of the people writing. So again, when we're talking this far back in history, you're going to be dealing with bias. And I'm going to hurry up. I swear to God, it's 5 o'clock, I know. Okay. So I go hurry. He disliked monks. He thought they sucked. Okay. Because they weren't trained. They really weren't. But we do know that we have lady from Marie's Estrada, Florida, in Tintern, which I made it to. I did not make it to these two. There's me in Tintern. Again, for scale, look how big this thing is. This would have all been stained glass. Okay. We, uh, and this again, I, we know that the physicians of the five would have had classical training at some point. Maybe they read it from the scriptorium. We don't know for sure if we have a suggestion, but we lost all the records, so. Just give me a few minutes and I'll get through the bone setters really quick. The bone setters, I really don't understand why this is not a bigger deal than Wales. They are amazing. And yet there was very, very little with them. And technically were they Welsh? Yeah, no, actually. Bone setters were. But the actual bone setters of Anglesey that made the giant uh, impact on orthopedic medicine started in 1743 when two small boys washed up. Turns out they were, they thought they were Spanish. And all these years, until just a few years ago, we assumed they were Spanish from a Spanish rug that was known to have happened. They actually were Southern Russian. That's what the DNA showed. One died, one got adopted into a family, and that was Evan Thomas, and he became a bone setter. And they basically just did that. They set bones. They reduced uh, dislocations. They set bones. His four sons became bone setters, the most famous of which was Richard Evans, and he had the best reputation, and he, became, and he actually had a consulting. This was not a full-time job. This was something he did. This was, a, this, was a, this was, you know, this was a side job. This was a little side hustle they had. Now, and I think maybe this might be the reason why we don't, they didn't have as much of the bone centers of Anglesey, because look where he went. He went to England. Yeah, he actually went to Liverpool. So he kind of did move out of Wales, and I'm like, are they holding a grudge or what? Because it really was hard to find something on them. Actually, in this town, they actually have a plaque to them. That was literally the only thing I could find. Did I go? No, because it was a plaque in a church, and the church no longer had a vicar. And I'm like, I am not driving halfway across the country, literally, to see a plaque that I probably couldn't have gotten into the church in the first place. Okay. Uh, Evan Thomas, Richard Evans. And then Evan wanted to be, that would be proper. And this is the biggest one, is you, Evan Thomas. And I really wanted to get to him. But you, Evan Thomas, went to school. He became a doctor, which only took six months back then. <coughs> I went to school for eight years. Okay, <laughs> six months. Hmm. Okay. He worked seven days a week, upwards of 12 hours a day without a break. He liked to work. He worked with the men in Liverpool's industrial area, so he dealt with a ton of orthopedic horrendous injury. Okay, because they did not have OSHA or anything else. He saw diseases of poverty, which is malnutrition, bad housing, and my nursing crew's been hearing about what happens to us when we're in close quarters and bad housing, all the respiratory and other diseases, meningitis. And he successfully married bone setting with modern medicine. 
I want you to understand, this is the 1800s. They had them figured out. Maybe you shouldn't walk on a broken bone. Okay? He is the one who came up with the idea maybe they should be at rest. I was in a hospital bed for three straight months without being allowed up. Give you an idea. He made his own splints. He also, he was his doctor, so he had other papers. But he was really wrong in those. He was really good at orthopedics, he's kind of sucked at some of the others, but he would never admit he was wrong. So he got a really bad reputation as far as that was concerned. That is him right there. Right. He was childless. He gave uh, all of his practice over to his wife's nephew, Robert Jones. He introduced the Thomas Splint as a treatment for soldiers in the Western Front treating compound fractures. I want you to look at that death rate, guys. Went from 80% to 10% just by properly treating these bones. So like I said, these guys are important. They deserve to have more notice than they have. And I struggle to find anything other than a few things on him. That's actually him treating the patient. His nephew was considered the father of orthopedics, and he's the grandfather, and I mean, we still use it. There's his, there's his splint. That's my leg. <laughs> Looks like the same, doesn't it? Okay. This is the splint he invented about 100 years before I needed it. Okay. And just, I didn't get a chance to talk about this. I'm not really going to talk about this. I would have loved to have done more with this, but it is what it is. This is actually at the Botanical Gardens. This is a modern apothecary where we start getting into the more modern medicines. I love it that they have all of Agatha Christie's poisons that she used in her books. <laughs> she used to be an apothecary. Okay. Uh, thanks to all of you guys. Okay. Thanks to Jeannie and the Maddox Center. Mary Baker, an archaeo tourist, I met her actually on my first time out. She took me around a second time. I have giant scads of sources. I got 40 different sources. You don't need to see them all. So, deal. Thank you.